Mama, prestami. The world is changed. I feel it in the water. I feel it in the earth. I smell it in the air. Much that once was is lost. For none now live who remember it. Welcome back, my lords and ladies, to the cast beyond the wall. We are normally your guides to all things Westerosi, but today we are flying on the wings of the Eagles to Middle Earth to provide you a review, analysis, and fan v. fan debate covering episodes one through seven, not quite the finale, a pre-season one finale lead up. Uh, We're going to be doing a review and analysis on everything we've seen so far in Amazon's Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power. So in today's discussion, we're going to provide our latest thoughts on the Rings of Power so far this season before providing uh, a few of the the spoilers. And uh, we'll close out the show by speculating about what we think might happen next. So uh, again, for those of you who tune into our House of the Dragon coverage, this is going to be much less scene by scene and more general overall thoughts on what we've seen so far. I'm your host, Caleb Masters. And for all you know, I'm Sauron at this point. (laughs) Who's Sauron? Could it be that elf? Could it be that human? Could it be the stranger? It's your host, Caleb Masters. So happy to be with you today. Joining us today, uh, returning to us uh, from our recap uh, that actually published yesterday of House of the Dragon Season 1, Episode 8, is Chad Perisman, the founder of uh, Ada Communications, uh, also a podcaster. Welcome back to the Cast Beyond the Wall. Yeah, and excited to be here. I feel like you suckered me in a little bit on the discussion because uh, uh, you know, we talked a couple of weeks ago and I told you I was way more excited for Rings of Power than House of the Dragon. And I still feel that way. I'm eager to uh, get into it. Love the discussion we had on on House of the Dragon. Happy that I'm watching that. But man, um, Rings of Power just, just gives me so much joy. That is great to hear. This is the counterbalance that we needed because uh, listeners who tuned into our discussion over season uh, episodes one and two will know that the other panelists at the time, uh, the Daniels, Daniel Stoll and Daniel Bokemper, we're also not huge fans of the show. I was coming down weirdly the warmest on it, but I wasn't overly enthusiastic. So Chad, you were just what the doctors ordered. I need someone who's loving everything about the show to talk with me about uh, what we've seen so far. And uh, I will say, I mean, we've had some ups and downs this season, but there's been some really incredible stuff uh, along with a lot of uh, not so incredible stuff, in my opinion. Lastly, Chad, thank you for doing a double header recording. This is a, a true gift. I never want to sucker someone as uh, knowledgeable as you in anything, but uh, also I do appreciate you being willing to record uh, two podcasts in one night. No, I'm uh, I'm I'm excited to be here, and uh, you know, uh, yeah, love love uh, love all things Tolkien. Uh, excited to to chat a little bit about this, you know, going into uh, the finale this week. Wish we had uh, you know two more episodes like Game of Thrones, but I. I will take what we got and and go back and likely rewatch you know after this is all said and done do a do a full rewatch of this uh, of this season. Uh, now, listeners, we're going to get into um, our thoughts on episodes one through seven here in just one moment. But I just want to quickly remind you that if you want to keep up with more of our Westerosi discussions, we have new episodes covering House of the Dragon that publish on Wednesdays. And you can also track our post on our social media channels, including our Twitter at cast underscore beyond underscore got. You can also find all of our uh, posts on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash cast beyond the wall. And lastly, whether you like House of the Dragon or Rings of Power or just hearing us talk about it, help us get discovered by more lords and ladies of the realm by heading over to Spotify and Apple and leaving us a reading. Or if you're on Apple Podcasts, uh, leaving us a review as well. Uh, this is the sort of uh, magic energy. Uh, you know, strangers bring trees to lives. And listeners bring RSS feeds and podcasts to life. (laughs) And lastly, we are not going to be spoiling any future events of the Rings of Power beyond what has been aired in episodes one through seven. I actually think Rings of Power, unlike House of the Dragon, where there's a fair amount of concrete information about House of the Dragon, the more I've watched of Rings of Power, the more I've understood that what they have taken from the appendices is very loose. So (laughs) I don't know. I don't actually know how much of what is coming is even knowable. 
With that said, Chad, we had done one other check-in earlier this season at right after the first two episodes aired and our first talking point, I just want our listeners to get to know you a little bit better and more specifically your relationship to Lord of the Rings and Tolkien's larger middle earth fantasy. Uh, it sounds like this season has brought you lots of joy. So I imagine you like Lord of the Rings, but could you elaborate here for us? What exactly is your relationship with Lord of the Rings? Yeah, I think I'm in like that perfect sweet spot. I mean, I've, so I've read the Hobbit. I've read the Lord of the Rings books. I've read them both more than once. Um, I loved seeing the original uh, trilogy in the theater. I saw all the Hobbit movies in the theater. I also uh, was one of those people, uh, this is the first time I had done it, but when Return of the King dropped, they actually did a uh, an all-day marathon where they showed in the theater the extended editions of Fellowship and Towers. And then you were, you know, this was still at the time where like, um, the night beat, yeah, it was on like a, uh, I guess it would have been Thursday. Uh, you know, they couldn't show it till midnight. You know, they, they, like that rule was still hard and fast. Um, and I think we got to, we started it at like 11. So it was one of those like, you know, spent all day in a movie theater um, with uh, my then girlfriend, now wife and a friend of ours and, you know, made friends with all the people around us and, um, you know, just have, yeah, uh, love the movies um, I won't say every year, but uh, most years I will do some type of original trilogy rewatch around the holiday season because that's when the, the movies drop. So I have seen those that I do watch the extended editions. It is so much easier now that they are just streaming on HBO Max. Although, again, I do own the full Blu-ray box set of everything with all of the hundreds of hours of extras and things like that. Um, so. Love you know, love the books, love those films. I I also think the Hobbit films are are play a play a part. Uh, I don't hate them like a lot of folks do. I, I there's a lot to enjoy there. Um, I think, but I am not. You know, I go so far as like I have a a deep love and a fandom of it, but I I don't go down into the like. You know, where I've taken college classes or you know have read the Cimmerillion and and you know all of the additional stuff you know i might deep dive into uh a wikipedia entry or a fandom entry or something like that uh you know down into somewhere but i i cannot name all the valar i cannot you know i don't know all of the additional histories um so i think like i'm at the perfect spot of like love love this stuff but not so much that i can argue about like well this actually contradicts this one line in the poem that Tolkien wrote they're like, you know, I'm I'm not that far along the path. So uh um, you know, loving it. I've I have a working knowledge uh of the world. And like I said, you know, uh, both both the you know the cinematic universe and the the original published materials. So what I'm hearing is we're gonna do the rest of this podcast in Elvish, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, no. yes, no. Uh yeah, a uh, black tongue, actually. We're gonna we're gonna translate it all to uh <laughs> uh, yeah, what 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 they speak in uh, what was the Southlands, and in now you know is Mordor now is known as Mordor. Yes, yes. yes. Oh great! <laughs> oh man, well, that was a great segue, uh, Chad. Thanks so much for sharing a little bit about uh, you know your love and enthusiasm of Lord of the Rings, and uh, I, I think I, I'm right there with you. I, I we have a few key differences. I won't re I will not reiterate what I've already shared in the previous podcast, but no. I'm with you in that I love the films. I actually don't hate them. Hobbit films as much as most people, though they definitely have their problems. I have read The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings and most of The Similarian, but I also couldn't tell you what happened in The Similarian outside of some very high broad strokes. And you're going to hate, you might hate me. I don't like Tolkien's prose specifically in The Lord of the Rings. I actually think The Hobbit is a great read. So uh, just so you can understand where I'm coming from. Um, and, uh, as I discussed with Daniel, the Daniels, Daniel Bo Kemper and Daniel stole in our initial review of episodes one and two, I'm pretty pro the show, not over the moon, but I generally like it. I, I just, the ambition of it and the world that they've crafted. And the, I like a lot of the characters, some more than others. Uh, but, uh, I, I will say that there is a very Tolkien sort of cadence to like how a lot of this information is delivered a very kind of historian's view of, what's going on in the world uh, that is, it, it sort of seems to me baked into the DNA. And I, I find myself a lot of times saying, yep, 
there are Tolkien fans who love this <laughs> shit <laughs> yeah, all the time. Yeah, yeah. I, and, uh, as a guy who likes the movies and the and I, I like a lot of the things about it, and obviously I respect the hell out of like even if I don't love the prose, Tolkien obviously like wrote the book on high fantasy, so I want to reiterate that. Um, so, but anyway, so you can kind of understand where I'm coming from. Uh, not too far off, but a couple key differentiators there. Yeah, absolutely. We have a gluttony of of genre TV that we live in right now. And yeah, that that's what I love, right? Like if this is not your thing, there's so much other stuff that you could be watching right now. Um, you know, and if you love Lord of the Rings, but you're not digging this or you're, you only love parts of it, you know, you can wait and binge them all, uh, you know, over Thanksgiving weekend, if you want, like, I, 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 I don't care. Like, um, you know, enjoy what you enjoy, like consume the way that you consume. And, you know, I, for me, I, I love that, you know, Fridays I am waiting for my wife to get home so we can eat dinner and watch this, you know, yes. versus, you know, I don't have to stay up late on a Sunday night for a very specific time. You know, this is, it is available to me whenever I want to watch it on, on, on Fridays. And so, you know, that the, the way that it's being released along with the content itself is just something that I'm, that I'm really enjoying. Um, it is, it is my second favorite show on TV right now. Well, I have to ask the question. What's the first? Uh, She-Hulk. Oh, uh, She-Hulk oh, nice. is, uh, you know, not to go too far, but it it is the first MCU show that I wish was actually like on regular TV. And we got like a 22 season episode uh, of it. The, uh, it. It just brings me the, this, you know, for She-Hulk to drop on, uh, on uh, Thursdays and then, you know, this to drop on Friday is just like, going into the weekend like I, I i'm just loving the the like i said the the tv that we're the the tv world that we're living in right now so ladies and gentlemen we are going to jump into our spoiler filled discussion of the first seven episodes of lord of the rings the rings of power so if you don't want to be spoiled go ahead and tune out now uh, as you can hear we're very enthusiastic so you will understand power of the unseen world. Evil does not sleep. It waits. There's far more at stake here than just our lives. Fight with me. For all Middle Earth. You've lost. What shall return? What are you? I am no god, at least not yet. You will be known at last for who you truly are. For you are Lord Sauron. If Sauron has returned... Then the Southlands are in grave danger. The Southlands are but the beginning. So according to IMDb, for those of you who are not familiar with the show... Somehow, uh, the official synopsis for Lord of the Rings, the Rings of Power reads epic drama set thousands of years before the events of J.R.R. Tolkien's The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings follows an ensemble cast of characters, both familiar and new, as they confront the long feared reemergence of evil to Middle Earth. So, Chad, with all that said, what have you thought about the first seven episodes of the show going into the finale? What what have you liked? What have you not liked? What, What has been your overall just general thoughts on the experience of watching so far? Yeah, again, love it. Uh, you know, I love the brightness of it. I love that we are actually visiting so many different places. Some, you know, that we are familiar with from the movies, some brand new, like Numenor, you know, we're getting to see a bunch of these things, you know, that we've never seen before. You know, we get to actually visit uh, Casa Doom at, you know, kind of its height of, of Dwarven Smithdom. Um, I think, you know, some of the portrayals, you know, the, the bromance between, uh, Elrond and Durin, um, is just fantastic to watch. Uh, uh, you know, it's one of my favorite things to see how that has played out. Um, so, you know, I am, I'm generally loving it. The pace I agree is a little, it's a little weird, you know, sometimes we don't visit everybody. Sometimes it feels like we're shoehorning. You know, I, I wish that we, the, the storylines were a little bit more evenly spread out, especially in those middle episodes. I feel like episode six and seven have really kind of, you know, kick things off. Obviously, you know, where there's, we're kind of hurtling towards this, this finale, 
Um, but yeah, somewhere in the middle, you know, I know you guys talked about that first episode does a lot of exposition. It does a lot of heavy lifting to kind of set the world. Um, I, I was okay with it. You know, I think those similarly, the, the first two episodes work well together to be able to watch them back to back. Um, and then, you know, I, I think there's enough to love in each of the next episodes to kind of keep you going, especially, um, you know, in kind of three, four, and five before we really get going, uh, you know, what I thought was in episode six. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to just, uh, I won't reiterate to me my thoughts that uh, I articulated in the first two episodes, but uh, I will say just today, and I don't often cite business leadership podcasts on my pop culture podcast, but I was listening to Brene Brown's podcast and she recently had an episode where she had both Adam Grant and Simon Sinek on her podcast at the same time, which was kind of a wild combo. But I want to say Simon Sinek at one point said, you know, we just need to talk about how we have completely opposing feelings at the same time more often. And let me, let me just, let me just preface it by saying this on one hand, I'm with you. Having a show readily available on either Friday night or Saturday morning has been the best thing. Either we watch it on Friday night, uh, we just we cook dinner, we order in, we watch the show on Friday night, knowing it's there, it's of a cinematic quality, or or maybe we wake up on uh, Saturday morning and do it over coffee and breakfast. Either way, it's a, an amazing experience. On the other hand, the more I watch this show, the more I am convinced it actually would would be better to binge. Because week to week, I sometimes don't feel like a lot happens. And the other thing that is becoming much more clear to me now that we're seven episodes in is that I don't know that this is going to feel like a season one, season two, season three, season four show. I feel like this is going to feel like one really, really big show that happens to be released in eight eight to ten episodes uh, a, a season. But so far, it, I'm... Very curious about how this next episode is going to end because so far it seems to be lending itself to this is not five chapters of one book. This is just the first 20 pages of a 100 page book, that sort of thing. And that I don't feel like the Hardfoot plotline has advanced at all since I talked about it last. I mean, yeah, they've moved around and that's about it. I don't even feel necessarily like the Casa Dune storyline has advanced that much. Now, that said, I do really like that story. So I want to make that very clear. But the pacing that you acknowledged it's a frustration to me on the week to week, but I think, you know, when it's all done, I actually do think this would be worth watching eight, all, all eight episodes back to back or whenever I feel like it, because it flows more like one really big story versus like more, you know, House of the Dragon or even Game of Thrones to a certain lesser degree. It's episodic in that your episode has a beginning, middle and end. And even though it is telling a larger story, you kind of can walk away saying, oh, this was what happened in this episode, in this episode. In my mind, even though I watch it like weekly TV, it all blurs together. Yeah, and I don't disagree. I I would put it somewhere in the middle of that scale. Um, again, you know, I think you've got a show uh, like She Hulk. I would also agree putting Game of Thrones, you know, in there, especially with the time jumps. You know, it is it is very clearly this is an episode. Part of that, right, is also that they're bringing in different directors. I'm not exactly sure how they shot. I don't believe that they shot um, Rings of Power with like multiple directors for each episode, or you know, a director per episode but I'm not, I'm not totally sure on that um, versus uh, a show like Andor to me feel that feels to me like um, they should be releasing three episodes at once because each of those is like a chat, like the, because where they stop each episode makes no sense. Uh, I, I agree with you. I think Lord of the Rings, I think it does have a little bit of a sense of, of an episodic feel, not as much as some, but I, I do feel like you know, particularly again, the last couple of episodes, you know, um, especially like episode six, you know, it ends with the explosion of Mount Doom. Like that to me feels like the end of an episode. It sets up the, 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 um, or is that f- how many episodes? No, we so that's episode seven, mm-hmm. right? So episode We're, six I'm is gonna... when, so, so, so the, the volcano erupts in episode at the end of episode six. Okay. Ep- yes. At the episode. So that feels like an ending to me, you know, it leads into what we see in episode seven. I agree. The Harfoots are kind of the conduit for the strangers storyline. And I, I feel like you're agree there. You know, I wish we would have gotten to what happened at episode seven, which is, you know, that kind of them going off on their own exploration. It feels very, you know, Bilbo in the Hobbit kind of thing. I, I wish, yes, that there was some way to get that back on, 
episode four or something like that. Like, you know, so we could have gotten a little bit, a little bit more there that said, you know, I love the songs that they're singing. I yes. love the little, the little references to what we, you know, the, the juicy sweet that we got this last two yeah. episodes ago. Um, so there's a lot to love um, about the Heartfoots. Um their storyline is not one of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then I guess my my bigger thing is I th- I feel that way about a lot of the storylines. Now, now the Hartfords is probably the worst offender in terms of like wow, I literally feel like nothing's happened. Galadriel's storyline I actually feel like has advanced quite a bit this season. A lot has happened yeah. with that one. Um, even if the Numenor stuff felt like it kind of dragged a little bit while we were there, I, I didn't care because it was so beautiful and it was so cool to see the city so lively and and the bombastic sequence in which they sailed off. I was like, wow, this feels like a season finale, but it's only episode four. <laughs> You know, yes. um, I love yes. that. I love that stuff. Like the, 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 where the, I felt like the pacing was, was really lacking. They made up for in production value. And I just enjoyed the, the world. How about you? It It is gorgeous to look at. I mean, that's, you know, look, we know this was expensive. Like you can see the money and it, and it looks realistic. You know, there, there's no, to me, they're not hiding anything. The, the orcs or the orcs, you know, if we're going to be uh, uh, sensitive, uh, to, to, you know, what they, what they want to be called. Um, you know, we're back to practical effects. We're back to like, it just like it, it oozes money. And I understand like that might turn off people, but like it, it is gorgeous to look at. It is, it is brilliantly well lit. It is, it, you know, it, it is fun. And just overall, you know, again, compared to, to some other things on TV, you know, I, I, I think I just like my villains um, villainy, you know, and I, I like that. Yes, we we're waiting to find out what the deal is with Sauron, but with Adar, I, I like having, you know, an evil character to look at. Like I, I like having an antagonist. I like knowing where we're, you know, we're going with that. You know, yes, there is some stuff that is waiting to be found out, but um, you know, I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not there uh, wondering if, uh, you know, Galadriel is going to, turn face and all of a sudden, you know, uh, you know, spring a dagger on someone like I am in maybe some other TV shows. Uh, now, I, okay. Again, I am of two minds. I, and this is why I love that we have options. And then again, we are in this embarrassment of riches. I love the complexity of characters that we get in other shows. Uh, I mean, watching better call Saul came out earlier this year, game of Thrones and house of the dragon, a lot of moral ambiguity, even though I House of the Dragon, which listeners, you can go check out that conversation. I feel like the show is positioning a certain character as the protagonist much more than some of the other characters. I still feel like there's a lot of complexity in terms of like, oh, who's good? Who's evil? Who am I rooting for? That said, when it comes to Middle Earth, it's cool. Let the bad guys just be evil. It's all right. Yep. And I, I do think that they are more so than maybe the films even uh, through the character Halbrand really sort of trying to explore – the ambiguity, I would say, uh, like in terms of like he, cause he is supposed to be this uh, the king uh, of the Southlands. And, I mean, we'll get to some theories in a bit. Some people even think he's Sauron. But uh, I, I at least at this point, it just seems like he's a guy who I'm not sure is a good guy. But they keep propping him up like he's the hero. And I find that really interesting, too. So like what happens when this guy's got the title you need? And the and the the bloodline you need, but then he's actually not that great of a guy. But you need uh, Galadriel needs him as a a sort of political tool in order for her to advance her agenda. We've got our mustache twirling orc ish villains that are very simple, very clean cut. But we also have a couple of characters in there where you're like, hmm, this is uh, still questionable. Um, I, I, I yeah, and that. I think we even actually get that with our villains, right? With you know. Adar is very much right. The, the father of the orcs, right. He like cares for them. I mean, ultimately, you know, his, uh, his plan to block out the sun is so that, you know, they are not hurt, you know, that they can be out during the daylight. Right. So they, they actually are like, look, they're killing a lot of people. Like they're certainly dastardly. Like, um, you know, he, if we're to take him at his word, like he believes he actually did the world a favor and killed Sauron. Um, and, you know, he just wants, like, his own little homestead to, like, for him and his children to to hang out on. Um, again, the orcs, I think, are much better here than, you know, when we see them later on in the world where they can actually speak. You know, they're not just grunting or, you know, know a handful of words like they, they seem to do in the uh, in the Lord of the Rings uh, trilogy. 
And so, you know, I think, I think we get a little bit of that, but we still know at the end of the day, like, look, Adar and the orcs are corrupted. They, you know, they are playing a role that Sauron has set for them and they are part of, you know, evil capital, capital E evil. Uh, and I think it just goes to, again, you know, I, uh, that's how I like my, I like my fantasy like that. Uh, you know, I don't, uh, you yeah, know, there's a, there's a lot of gray area I can get in a lot of other places. I don't need it in my, in my genre fiction. All right. Fair enough. I, I you and I will differ on that point, uh, which is why yeah. I tend to prefer the, the Martin stuff. But I think there's a, again, I just want to reiterate it's preference is even a strong word. It depends on what kind of mood I'm in. Right. So I like that. I have both options available to me and I think both shows are doing what they do pretty well. Now, before I start doing too many comparisons, I, I just wanted to get your take on what we've mentioned a couple storylines, which one, I think there's really four main storylines. So you have the Harfoot storyline, you've got the Elrond storyline, you've got the Galadriel Halbrand storyline, and then you have the storyline um, with, uh, gosh, what's his name? The, 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 the kind of the, the folk, the people who are living in the Eastlands trying to survive. Um, so like, or the Southlands rather, not Eastlands, sorry. Southlands. Southlands. Yep, 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 yep. Uh, the, the, the villagers of the Southlands trying to, to survive, which one of those has been the most compelling for you to watch? The Elrond Doran stuff, you know, again, knowing, you know, spoilers, I, I guess, you know, we, we have to at least include spoilers for the, for the movies. We know Kella Brimbor, like we know the role that he will play, right? He will be duped by Sauron. He will create, you know, the, the rings of power. Clearly Elrond has a role to play in that, but this combined where like Elrond and, and Durin, I feel like are the most earnest, right? When Durin has to lie to Elrond, you know, who now he you know considers a brother, like it pains him, right? Mm-hmm. Elrond was willing to live up to his oath that he made to Doran on the rocks of Casa Doom. You know, he stood up to to the High King of the Elves, uh, you know, to hold up that elf. So, like, you know, these are again, like they, they are, they are, they are charismatic, but they are also like they they are very clear morals, and like, you know, they they are doing what they believe truly in their heart is like the best, not just for themselves, but like for the world at large, even Galadriel, who I love her storyline. She feels a little bit, maybe corrupted is too strong of a word, right? But like her, her motivation is still unclear. You know, she, she is not, you know, she's doing this because of an oath she swore to her brother. And, and, you know, how much of that is now just driven by vengeance mm-hmm. more than actually doing what she believes is is the the right thing to do. I am completely with you on the on the storyline. I, I really like the the Durin the Fourth and Elrond storyline, and it, it's uh, again it's it's consistently been my favorite stuff to watch throughout the season. But this uh, episode seven, I ha- actually have quite a bit of frustrations with the most recent episode six. Incredible episode seven, uh, but but. For me, this, with Elrond, with the Elrond Dorian storyline, no, 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 no. the uh, Elrond Dorian uh, storyline. That's that's the saving for me. The saving grace of episode okay. seven yes. is the Elrond yes, Dorian yes, storyline yes. because the way that Duran sticks up to his father during the yes. third, he says, "I'm more of a brother to Elrond than my own blood, flesh and blood." I just, I was moved. He knows he's gonna lose, but he does it anyway because he believes in that relationship and that bond so deeply. And again, the performances I think are from those two actors are tremendous. Uh, so again, for the, the really the highlight of the season for me. The other thing I would say, this wasn't immediately apparent to me, but it, it, it's it, it's been really fun to watch them learn how they are themselves, but pawns in a larger game and how, like to your point, how they are trying to navigate that together as brothers and also in hopes to achieve the best result given the circumstances they are being forced to work together in. So clearly the dwarves have their own motives and the, el- the elves super have their own motives that they're, they're playing at. Like Elrond didn't even know why he, like what he didn't even know that they were going in, to the doors for mithril at the you know originally so i just think yeah. that 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 again that's where they work in that kind of like gray area where are the elves bad or the dwarves bad uh they're both kind of like just really self-motivated on their own goals and again we'll see where the show goes but that's sort of what sauron's going to use to capitalize uh and 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 achieve his goals is these these groups are not working together Absolutely. And, you know, and I, uh, you know, I think it's worth shouting out um, Disa as well, Doran's, Doran's wife. I love that she has a role to play in this, right? Like, you know, she is one of these kind of 
singers of of the rocks, but she is integral in repairing the damage between you know the 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 relationship damage between uh uh, Dorian and Elrond in those in those early episodes, right? And then in this, to your point, in this last episode, she is standing by her husband, saying, "Look, you will be king one day. You have to do what's right." And again, I could be proven wrong. I don't get the sense that this is out of uh, a power grab. You know that she wants to be queen of the dwarves, anything like that. You know, she truly believes that like this is what Dorian needs to do. Um, you know, in order to be a, a fair and just uh, king. You know, and, and basically says, look, your father's out of touch. It's interesting to watch. You know, we see a lot of these old, you know, and again, you know, races that live, you know, theoretically for hundreds of years. But, you know, there's a there's a lot of old bad blood, whether it's between the dwarves and the elves, between the elves and the, the Numenorians. You know, there's a lot of kind of historical hate there. And even between, you know, the elves and the men of the Southlands, you know, they they don't they feel like they they haven't been trusted because of things that their their ancestors did. I, I'm fine with the that conflict there. Um I don't necessarily need it, you know, in in some of these other places. I, I think that's fair. And uh I think I will just let throw this out there. My biggest criticism of the show so far is episode seven. Here's how I mean I was middle of the road to positive on the first five episodes. I thought episode six was tremendous. Big battle. Yeah. See, some of these storylines converge. I, I'm not like here to say I was right, uh, but I had, I don't know about you. I had, ex- I actually had sort of predicted the Southlands are going to become Mordor with the tunneling system and stuff. I didn't know that that was exactly what their scheme was to get the water to filter down into the lava and make the, the eruption. But I was like, yeah, they're doing, they had alluded to the fact they were trying to blot out the sunlight. And I was like, oh, okay, so this is going to be Mordor uh, is essentially. So it wasn't to say, oh, I figured it out, but it was mostly like when seeing how they did it, I was just, my mind was kind of blown. I was really impressed with how they executed on that. And I thought it was a very, a great way to fulfill that whole storyline. That was honestly my number two weakest behind the heart, right? Just barely above the hard foot. So it really paid off in some meaningful ways. Uh, and again, to see, uh, to see the storyline with uh, Galadriel and Numenor, the Numenorians showing up uh, again, just, I was like, okay, I sat through this for five episodes. It's worth it. And had this tremendous payoff and volcano erupts. And I'm like, Holy cow, cataclysmic event. Yeah. And I will add, I think that, that all of those, the conversations and the exchanges, right. That Ador has with Halibran and Galadriel, I think also, goes a long way to yes. kind of shore up that that storyline. Yes. Yeah, I don't know. I tremendous great scenes, like some of the best yeah. scenes in the show. And then episode ha- 7 happens. I'm sitting here thinking, "Wow, cataclysmic." And my understanding is a lot of the characters in this storyline, obviously if your main players like Ella uh, uh you have uh like uh, Isildur um, Ellen deal. Like, th- th- yeah, there's these people who we know aren't going to die. But there's a fair number of characters here that are like not based on real characters from the appendices even. So I was like, oh man, they're going to kill a lot of people that we've invested in time off and it's going to be really sad. And I know it's not Game of Thrones. It doesn't need to be, but just like <laughs> the idea that this like found <laughs> fundamental universe changing thing happens. And then one dude, we might've spent five minutes of total screen time with dies. And that's supposed to be the big loss. I'm like, okay, well, now I just don't know if I can like take it seriously the next time they say something bad's going to happen. It doesn't ruin the show for me because I still think the way that you even yeah, the way, right. even the way you've laid it out kind of like where we're going with these sort of races at odds with each other and that's sort of what is motivating the craft of the Rings of Power is not them working together, it is them working together to achieve their own goals and eventually work against each other. Like that's that's so cool. I love it. But the episode seven, again, Durin and Elrond uh, removing that from the, the, to the table was a big, big letdown for me. What, what did you think of that last episode? You know, I don't think I was as hard on it. I do agree. I thought we were going to see again. We, you know, this is one of those things where like we know a Sildur is not going to die. We know that his horse is gonna, likely his horse is going to go find him the same way that um, Strider's horse, you know, kind of brought him uh you know Sate rescued him in in two towers um so there's some there's some parallels there obviously because he is his kin right he's he's of his of his line so somewhat i appreciate that um i agree you know there were there were 
lots of other deaths, clearly, just not characters that we knew the names of or or cared about. Um, you know, I think blinding the the queen, uh, Muriel, has has an effect, and and the reveal of that of like, you know, the you know, I can't wait till the smoke clears, and it's like, oh, we we've been out of the smoke for you know a mile now. Um, I thought that was actually a really interesting uh, reveal. Um, I think there are some interesting ways that can play out. Maybe right? she's one of the few people that's touched the uh, Palantir or Palantir. Um, and so, you know, uh, and I think, right, that certainly in like Greek mythology and things like that, right, there's the idea of like people that don't have um, actual vision, but still have, you know, some type of sight. So, I, you know, will be interesting to see if she can still see the future, even though she can't see the present, you know, in, in some way. So I, I'm not as hard about it. You know, I actually thought this was the most interesting Harfoot. Yeah, you know, we get. And and again, I love that, like, like this is a world that has magic and and uses magic. Right. And again, like, even though we don't know the rules around it and like we don't know what the stranger is yet or who he is. But the fact that, like, he can make those apples grow the next day and then we get these cultists who are able to, you know, both consume and create fire like that like i that i want to see more of that but like i love the fact that like we that is the one storyline that we're getting actual magic from you know i guess the mithril and and you know being able to kind of save that leaf and whether or not it can actually what it can do to save the the elves is uh is to be seen but like that's that's the one where we're getting it's a world that we know that has magic and that's the one storyline that is that is using it so i I wasn't as hard. I think you're right. I think six is the, has been the top, but I don't think seven nearly falls to like what some of those other episodes, you know, it, it's not my least favorite. I, th- I think that's fair. I think my, in my rage, I had forgotten <laughs> uh, about the very cool reveals in the Harfoot storyline uh, that I'm expecting, hopefully getting some meaningful pay, uh, payoff uh, in the next episode. Uh, well, Chad, we're running out of time here, but I, d- I-, I do have to ask, of course, uh, when- whenever doing reviews, I do like to rate film or television on a score of A to F like you would in school. So A, B, C, D, skip E for some reason, F, uh, pluses and minuses are allowed. How would you rate the Rings of Power so far this season? I'm a fan. I'm I'm all in on this. I'm I'm giving it an A minus. You know, o- overall, I and part of that is I'm betting on the payoff of the of the season finale here, um, and knowing right like how much more of this show and this storyline is to come. But I'm loving it. Uh, you know, whether whether it's episode by episode or take it as a whole thing. You know, I think that. Um, it's telling a, a great story and uh, to be able to see again, the money being spent on telling, you know, a, a high fantasy story like this again. Um, you know, I, I never thought after the Lord of the Rings trilogy, I didn't think we would ever see something, you know, with, with that much care and that much love as I think we're seeing right now. So uh, I, I'm excited for it. And I hope it, I hope it opens up, you know, the doors for, yeah, there, there's been a lot of other fantasy shows on TV and partic- particularly streaming, um, but none, I think, crafted as well as this. And so, uh, you know, I I'm hoping that, you know, this this really does kind of open the doors to to some other stuff. What are, what are you giving it? Like C plus? No, 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 no. I'll stick with a B. I think I gave it a B last time. I'm going to stick with a B. Had we only reviewed episodes one through six, I would have gone from I think I gave a B for episodes one and two to an A. But see, I'm dropping it back down to a B. And I, here's the thing. I think on the macro level, I am so invested in what this show is doing. Like, uh, not to beat a dead horse, but like the high level story, which is sort of like how these rings are being crafted, why they're being crafted, I think is just so compelling and so interesting. And it gives us another avenue in which to explore Middle Earth, which I do think is a really, really lived in, beautiful world. And like you said, to have this sort of a budget is just unfathomable. It's almost unbelievable that a show like this yeah. that costs this much money exists. <laughs> it is lightning in a bottle, I would say. I think my problems lie mostly with the like the writing on an episode by episode. There's certain stories that I'm less invested in and certain characters I'm less invested in. You know, maybe when it's all done, whenever assuming they get all five seasons out the door, I hope they do because I'm really just curious. Maybe it'll all fit together a lot better than it has so far. 
I just am having a hard time imagining a, a final episode that ties it together. And I said, ah, yes, that's a complete season of TV. Doesn't this have to end with the death of Elendir and, and Isildur taking, you know, Sauron's handoff? I mean, that, that like. Yeah, well, that's where it's got to go. That's where it has to go, right? And then, and then that kicks off, you know, I, I can't see the show ending any other way and agree that it's going to take a while to get there, but I don't know, maybe not, maybe not as long as we think. And I, I think, I think there's a lot, I agree. There's a lot of world building. There's a lot of stuff um, that there's a lot of heavy lifting that are being done in these first couple of episodes. And my hope is, you know, now we're, we're off to the races, um, especially depending on what happens in this, in this uh, season finale. Yeah. And I'm excited for the season finale. I make it clear, even though I'm, I, again, I, I feel like I'm positive, middle positive, not over the moon, uh, but also still, I'm looking forward to seeing the last episode. Can't wait to see what they do with it. Um, well, again, running short on time, but I did want to quickly get very quickly your thoughts. Who is the stranger? Chad, tell me. <sighs> you know, I, I'm still holding out hope that he is not Gandalf, that he is in fact, one of, one of the other, uh, wizards, I would love to for them to to expand and not just to give them a little bit of um, you know, right? Because again, we know as Sildor didn't die underneath that 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 roof collapse. I would love to have another major character, particularly another magic user that actually has some stakes that maybe gets killed off in the third season. You know, that mm-hmm. maybe you know could actually be harmed. Um, so I. I will be fine if it turns out that he is Gandalf. I'll be fine if he turns out that he's Sauron. Um, but I'm really hoping that he is he is one of the other wizards um, that, you know, the books, one, one of the blue wizards, right, that, that goes off and we don't actually know and they, they can, they get to write a new story with. Who do you think the stranger is? Well, I, I, he's definitely a wizard. I lean towards Gandalf for the fan service part. I, I will say, and again, we'll see how this last episode goes. As a fan of Lost and many uh, mystery box shows, I, I I do have an affinity for them. This is not, high fantasy is not a place I like my mystery box uh, to live. And uh, I will say at this point, I'm just like, all right, just just freaking tell us who he is. <laughs> like, it's like, I, I feel like I would actually appreciate the character more and under, like, in, 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 like in what he's doing if I knew who it was. I think it's probably Gandalf. Maybe Saruman could be interesting. Yeah, the the cultist wearing white is the one thing that makes me think it could be Saruman. Because again, you know, when what the the version of Saruman that we know is he, you know, he he is Saruman the White. Mm-hmm. You know, um, so I, I, I agree. It, it, it could be him. I would actually be okay with that uh, as well if it turns out that he is, you know. Um, someone that we know will eventually be corrupted, but is not initially evil at the, at the outset. Yes. I would love to be, see, that's the thing with the mystery box is I feel like we've, the, the internet has thrown out every imaginable option. So I'm just like, and I, and I just want to be surprised because we've invested in this long. I want to be surprised, but well, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. I'm, I'm hopeful. Yes. And, uh, you know, I, I thought it was, uh, I've seen a couple of memes and things out there that, uh, Sauron is the new Mephisto. <laughs> um, yeah and and it's like hey, everyone is sauron um i yes. i am i am hoping i hope for two things one i actually hope we don't get a, a sauron reveal in the finale I, I think it's fine to draw that out and i i hope it is a character that we have not seen yet i hope that none of these kind of wild guesses turn out to actually be sauron a big one i'm hearing is that halbrand might be a uh, sauron yeah on one hand i feel like from the writing perspective, general writing perspective for Halbrand, it would be terrible, but it would be really compelling for Galadriel. So I'm like, mm, I don't know. We'll see. I think that like really messes up Galadriel if, you know, uh, I mean, right. Still TBD. Uh, the two of them seem to also have some, uh, some romantic chemistry. It seems. So, you know, if that, if that turns out to be the case, you know, I'm, I'm still holding out hope. He is who he says he is. And, and he turns out to be, whether it's the witch king or whether it's one of the other men that got corrupted that that turn into uh, the black writers, you know, I, to me that feels like a more compelling story. That again, you know, he is he is a man that is that is fighting whatever demons are still to be revealed about what happened during you know the 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 last war or you know at some point, um, and that you know ultimately right he is. 
he is corruptible. Um, you know, men men are corruptible is a big is, is a big uh, storyline throughout Tolkien. Corruptible but redeemable. And so, you know, I, I'm hoping that that turns out to be the case that that Halibrand truly does want to do good. Uh, but uh, you know, ultimately, is is potentially corrupted by the power of the One Ring. Well said, Chad. I I tend to agree. I think the slow build of revealing that this is just a, a storyline, sort of outlying the slow moral decay and potential redemption, to be more interesting than just the uh, potential fan, more fan servicey approach. One fan service thing that I think that they that I would love to see them do, and actually have the balls to do this. I would love to get your take on this. Do we get Tom Bombadil? At some point in 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 the fight in, in a world where you're gonna spend three billion dollars and you know travel all over the map, do do we get do we at least get a Tom Bombadil appearance? All right. So let me just throw this out there. <laughs> I kind of want Tom Bombadil to show up. Not because I actually want him to show up, but because then I can just finally we can finally silence the where's Tom Bombadil? Why wasn't he in the movies conversation? Be like, listen, you want your Tom Bombadil? Here he is. Give him a really good one episode arc, beginning, middle, end, on one episode. Wrap it up. It somehow forwards our character development uh, on, on their journey. So let's do it. One just really trippy episode. The Harfoots stumble onto him. You know, it, it, yeah, we realize that they are they are what will be become the Shire. I, I agree. I'm with you. Like, I, I really hope we like that's the one fan servicey thing that I do hope we get before before this all wraps up. I mean, we did get Cal Brimbar. So, I mean, like, I feel like anything's possible. Yes. Obviously, he is more critical to the, the forging of the rings, but a fan favorite character from the histories they brought back for the story. So absolutely. All right. Uh, well, we are out of time today. Chad, uh, thanks again for hopping in to talk with us about your impressions of the Rings of Power episodes one through seven uh, leading into our, the finale, which uh, if you're listening to this the day it drops, finale should be airing tomorrow on Friday. And uh, Chad, thanks also for being a voice of positivity because that last episode <laughs> took a more negative turn than I expected. Happy to be here. You know, just just like when I was on with the uh, the Thor episode, like uh, I, I am not nearly as critical. I the the stuff I enjoy I I absolutely love so uh, you know the next time you need uh, a little a little positivity would love to uh, to come back and a- enter one of the the worlds of your podcasts and and let you know how much uh, how much I'm loving something awesome well you always have a welcome uh, seat at the table so I I appreciate it. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks so much, man. Of course. And uh, listeners, again, just a quick reminder, if you enjoyed this conversation, please make sure to rate and review the podcast on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or hit us up on social media on the Cast Beyond the Wall on Twitter at Cast underscore Beyond underscore GOT or on Facebook at Facebook.com forward slash Cast Beyond the Wall or send us an email with your thoughts on the Rings of Power episodes one through seven or even the finale to uh, Cast Beyond the Wall at live.com. Chad, thank you so much for taking uh, time out of your money. Where can people keep up with you and your work online? I'm C. Parisman everywhere, Twitter, Instagram. I'm pretty easy to find. Thanks so much for tuning in to our Rings of Power check-in at episode seven of the show. We'll catch you again next time.